Okay, uh, Paul, uh, I will start with a small introduction about Lily Excellence Center, then I, over to you, Paul, okay? Okay, and do, I, do I share the screen? Okay. Sure, I will make you co-host, then you can uh, share the screen. Okay. Sure. sure. Hello, everybody. Greeting from Lily Excellence Center. Thanks for taking time out to meet, and uh, same with us for our today panel discussion. We are a multinational organization headquartered in London, the UK. Our company specializes in international counseling services for healthcare projects associated with healthcare. Our expertise lies in midwifery, OB-GYN services of global standard. It comes with the IT counseling in healthcare as well. We offer midwifery and ob education globally and midwifery services to clients from various countries, offer training and certification to aspiring midwives, doctors, healthcare professionals, childbirth educators and caregivers, and we conduct workshops to generate awareness on the benefits of natural birth and midwifery, support women empowerment and work tirelessly in all related fields to achieve our ultimate goal, the betterment and progress of mankind. We are uh, trained professionals and students from Europe, Asia, Middle East, the US, the UK, Africa, to name a few. And the team consists of doctors, obstetricians, childbirth educators, accordate trainers, and senior consultant midwives from across the globe. Hope you enjoy today's panel discussion. So today our panel discussion is about human rights in childbirth. Our uh, panel leader is Paul Goldman. I will, I will ask Paul to introduce himself and then introduce our panelists, then we will start our panel. Thank you so much. Please, over to you, Paul. Thank you, Lily. So I'm a midwife and a legal advisor. I've worked over 30 years with childbirth globally. And I will present a brief presentation, about 10 minutes, and then each panel member will give a couple of minutes addressing the realities or how they like to answer the questions which we will raise. So if my screen is being shared and you can yes. see it, yes. I'm wondering why it's yes. okay. We would be happy to have a small brief introduction from you, Paul with more or, yes please can you okay so yeah, i work introduce yeah thank you i work with birth in hospital out of hospital including twins and breech births i'm very focused on holistic birth i work with breastfeeding and tongue tie release issues quite often i find throughout my career women are traumatized their partners are traumatized and their babies and it's unnecessary medical interventions mostly that are causing the unnecessary trauma so to prevent that, we need the calmness and confidence. And that's how I'm practicing. And you'll see some of the pictures of my practice. But it's not just my practice. There's many great practitioners around the world who have the calmness and confidence. So my work has been sometimes in pediatrics, sometimes neonatal, but throughout it's also been midwifery with families from Pakistan, from India, from every country. I'm registered and been working in New Zealand, Australia, the UK, and internationally. The legal advice I give also is to the United Nations. There's a committee that reports on elimination of discrimination against women, CEDAW. And I find it's very important to raise things at international level because one country is learning something another country could benefit from. So that's why we're here today also sharing international ideas and experiences. So now I move into the presentation. I'm just setting a timer for 10 minutes. It's easy to talk a long time about birth. So how can human rights save lives? This is a question we can have in our mind. Whenever we have investigations, we will often find that there are preventable deaths and serious injuries to mothers and babies due to unsafe maternity care. And that's a recent report in the UK, but it could be any country, any hospital. If we did an investigation, we would find preventable deaths and injuries to mothers and babies. I would add also to the staff, they often have trauma themselves. There's a key case. Now, there are 
in law, you might find a case that supports your argument and a case against your argument. This case very much supports what I'm talking about. The main right we have is the right to private and family life. That's Article 8 of the United Nations Convention on Human Rights. This was put into action just over 10 years ago with Ternovsky versus Hungary in the European Court of Human Rights. It was a successful case where a mother took the country, Hungary, to court saying it failed to provide home birth midwives. So every country, if it's really not going to breach this human right, must provide home birth midwives and home birth facilities because the woman has the right to determine how and where to birth and by implication with who. So she may choose a midwife and the midwife isn't registered there, or they don't have any midwives, so the state is failing. So if a midwife from another country comes in to work there, that's a very good defense is necessity. It was needed or required for them to come in because there's no local midwives to provide for that. So this is the actual mother, the woman who gave birth. And part of her argument was her midwife was being sanctioned by the government. If you sanction the midwife, you sanction the woman. If you prevent the midwife from working, you prevent the woman from having home birth. Very simple, clear links. The European court found in favor of this mother and the midwife by implication. However, cases since then have not always gone down the same path. So I've just said women have the right to choose. I mean, there's a classic example of a great, powerful home birth. Yeah, images are very powerful. And um, the other rights, obviously, we have the right to life. We also have the right not to suffer cruel and inhumane treatment, which is to suffer torture. And actually, midwives are often sanctioned and very distressed by the treatment that they get. They can take actions for having their human rights breached, just as well as women can take actions, and partners and families. Six is kind of academic. There's a right to fair process when midwives are being sanctioned or investigated or whatever. They have a right to fair process, which they rarely get, or sometimes in varying degrees. So as I mentioned, we've all got the right to private and family life. That includes the midwife as well as the woman. And the right not to be discriminated against is really useful to involve the United Nations Committee on Elimination of Discrimination Against Women, because they not only make recommendations every three years, they will and can make a judgment as they did in a case to do with Spain, which I will show you later. I feel there's a general institutional protection for obstetric violence or any kind of violence. Violence is an unwanted touch or threat of a touch. You know, we're going to cut your vagina, we're going to cut your belly, take the baby out. If it's done in a very aggressive way, very rushed way, because we've all seen compassionate practitioners who are able to take time, be kind, and others who are not. So when we're causing fear, or we're actually touching somebody without their consent. This is assault, battery, trespass to the person. It can even be um, medical negligence. And if there's a death, it could be manslaughter. There is gross negligent manslaughter actions, including criminal as well as civil actions. So looking at the history of law, not so long ago, 30 years ago, rape was allowed within marriage. Finally, in a case in the highest court in the UK, the judges said that this is a fiction of implied consent and it has no useful purpose to serve today in the law of rape. There's a fiction, I would argue, that when you go into a hospital, you've consented to everything. You have not consented. You must be explicit in your consent. So I see the future of the institution of hospitals and the protection they sometimes have that hopefully will come down and the rights of the individual come up. There have been various cases. Italy, many countries have done surveys. Between 30 and 50% of women will often say they had obstetric violence. So if we have power, it gets abused. Is there a feeling of obedience to authority? Is there a feeling of compliance or is there defiance? These are things I would like to provoke the panel and all of us to think about during this presentation. The words bodily autonomy, that means nobody can touch you without your consent. 
it raises the question, is it inevitable for women to lose their privacy, independence, their rights and their liberty during childbirth? As a common phrase of losing your dignity or leaving it at the door of the hospital and pick it up on the way out? No, there's no reason why a woman should lose her dignity at any stage of her life in any place, especially a, a caring maternity service. So I've mentioned they can be criminal actions as well as civil actions and when the police fail to take the criminal actions I would quite like to see more actions against the police and it's actually relatively easy to do that. This is a brief explanation about abuse of power. When people have power they abuse it and there were studies done on this. I will move on to the other slides and just leave this there for people to come back to. So when people look at having power and how it's abused, it's quite distressing that people, particularly in uniforms, I find, will be telling others instead of asking others, what would they like? So when we're witnessing obstetric violence, we need to break the silence. And there's very little protection for whistleblowers, but our own conscience demands it because we're living with secondary trauma, post-traumatic stress disease, affects the midwives, the carers, the observers of violence, not just the women and babies who have that violence. So the case in Spain, very succinctly, the woman was taken by, by police back to the hospital for an, an induction she had declined. And the courts in Spain said, the doctors know best, they're there to help you. And the judgment by the United Nations Committee said, no, that was unlawful to interfere with the bodily autonomy of a pregnant and birthing woman and they found against the state of Spain and they awarded compensation and we need more judgments and that only happens when we take action. So my pet word is action, how to stand up for our rights. So we only have the rights that we do stand up for. There's a beautiful poem, we'll illustrate that in a moment. They're not only the rights of women and babies, it's the rights of the midwife, the rights of the baby, for example, to claim its blood. When a cord is cut the moment the baby's born and it's lost a glass full of blood, 50, 100, 150 mils of blood that could have gone to the baby, where's the rights of the baby? And there's where's the rights of the partner who has a traumatized uh, woman who may be depressed into the future. And this affects an impact on the whole community and the whole of humanity. It's a global family thing. So here's a quick extract from a poem I've changed a bit. First they came for the communists and I didn't speak out because I wasn't a communist. Then they came for the unionists and I did not speak out because I wasn't a unionist. Then they came for the Jews, the Christians, the Hindus, the Muslims, and I didn't speak out because I wasn't one of them. Then they came for me and there was no one left to speak out for me. This is how we are a global family. A quick reference, this case in Russia, Connor Volova, they were turning the syntocinon drip on and off. They were queuing up to do vaginal examinations, all without consent. And they thought they were protected by the institution of the hospital. In Spain, I've mentioned that case in Australia, the midwife who was criticized, she gave up her license. She did breach and home birth twins. And they accused her of gross negligent manslaughter for five years. She became a lawyer. In a way, most of us need to study more law. And I hope that's what you will get from this presentation today. And think about the European Court of Human Rights, the judgments there that can be useful to us. Again, a powerful picture. We see the generation, this little girl is three or four years old. She's witnessed her mother giving birth at home to her baby brother. And what impact, what positive impact this has on the next generations. This is Agnes Gerab, the Hungarian midwife. She was actually put in jail. And I would suggest how do we get human rights is a mixture of mediation, negotiation, advocacy. And this is a BBC documentary there. I'm out of time and I'm on the last slide. So use your legal actions, use organizations like United Nations, use social media, keep calm, carry on. Wishing everybody self-compassion here. Thank you very much. Oh. That was a brief one in India where the woman said, I will go for a VBAC rather than be tortured and have a traumatic birth. And there she is. I was there with her. Okay, thank you very much. Over to our host.
Leela, do you want to come Thank back in? Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you so much for a very fantastic presentation. So I want to leave panel to you. And I want all of our panels before that to introduce their beautiful profile because I cannot explain how wonderful our educational team are. I want everybody introduce themselves in two minutes and we will go for our next session. That is the question. Thank you so much. So let's start from Gail. Yeah. What you want me to talk next? Please introduce yourself, Gail, and we want to hear about your wonderful job and work. Yes, in two seconds. Well, two minutes. Okay. Um, well, I'm Gail Johnson. I'm a Canadian. Uh, however, I trained to be a midwife in uh, the state of Texas when I was in my 40s, and I've now been a midwife for 40 years. Uh, because I, uh, the reason I wanted to be a midwife was because I did see women being abused um, in the hospitals. And I decided that I could do it better. And so to that end, I became a midwife that mainly works out of hospital births. I work in birth centers and at home births. I have done that now, as I said, for 40 years. Um, I now travel all over the world. I serve women all over the world who cannot find a provider uh, that um, is legally allowed to uh, use her skills at home births. It seems that, uh, as uh, Paul had said, you know, they came for me because I, and there, that poem, I'm very familiar with it when they came for me. What they have done with, um, even the legal licensed midwives all over the world, they have limited their scope of practice. And as a result, women are finding more and more midwives that cannot or will not risk their license to serve them. And so they phone me or they hire me off the internet. And there's a, a group of us traveling midwives. And we go to serve those that cannot be served in their own countries. This is very sad. We're also finding that um, women uh, will actually say they're going to stay home and do the birth by themselves in, in all countries because they cannot find the care that they wish to have. Uh, I find one thing that we're lacking in the medical profession. We think we give good care, but we've lost the caring. And women today, in a high-tech society, they want high-touch care. And um, many of us are willing to provide that. Uh, Evidence-based care says that uh, the good practices are not being taught nor used in the average medical facility. So who I am, I'm a woman's advocate for freedom of choice freedom to birth where and with whom she chooses. Um, I've been doing this for so long that it's just my whole beingness. I love women. I love babies. I think babies should be born at home, just as I also think we should die at home. Uh, institutions have policies, protocols that are for the staff because they do serve many, many people. Um, and they have to have some kind of routine, but sometimes they're not quick to change when new evidence comes about. Uh, I consider episiotomy sexual abuse. I consider birthing on your back abuse because it reduces the pelvis by 30%. Um, I consider telling a woman she has to deliver in this position abuse. Uh, so I am very, outspoken, but I love change. Thanks. But I also am going to talk a little bit, maybe, about the women themselves. They have eight, seven to eight months once they find out they're pregnant to gain information yeah. on where and with whom they're going to birth. Yeah, thank you so much. So if you let uh, we go for introduction first to, to all of our uh, wonderful team, and then we will come back to you again. 
We will have another another Angel from Lily Excellence Center, Dr. Ricardo <laughs> Angel, or <laughs> one of our wonderful guys of the team. I'm I'm calling according seniority of the people. Dr. Ricardo, can you please introduce your wonderful profile for people, please? Salam alaikum, all my friends. I'm oh, happy. Salam alaikum. Salam alaikum. I'm happy to be here and be part of this group trying to help the most I can through my experience as an obstetrician for more than 35 years working in Brazil in my private practice. Uh, I've been working uh, with uh, Reuna uh, Humanization of Na uh, Childbirth Network in Brazil for more than 30 years. And, and uh, this is the, the branch of humanization of childbirth in Brazil that deals with the governments and with the policies and with the laws. We approved the law of companionship in Brazil 2015. It was a huge thing that we did in Brazil. And I think that uh, we, we need to have this kind of discussion with the government and with the other corporations. We have a specific uh, characteristic of childbirth in Brazil. We imported the model of childbirth care that the United States spread all over the world that is centered in the work of doctors. We almost destroy all midwifery that we have in Brazil. So in Brazil, 98% of birth occur in hospitals. Only 2% of babies are born outside hospitals. We have very few um, um, birth centers in Brazil, Sao Paulo, Brazil, um, Bahia, and some others, other places in Brazil, in Minas Gerais, where Edson works uh, in Sofia Feldman. But in my state, we don't have birth centers. And in my state, no midwife assists births in hospitals, only doctors. So we have a very center, doctor center assistance in Brazil. And that's why Brazil is known in the whole world as one of the world champions, not only in football, because we are the best in football, but the, the champions of the world in cesarean sections. And we have uh, two sectors, at, at, at least three sectors in Brazil. We have the public sector, we have the private sector, and we have the mixture of them that is the, the companies uh, like um, the ones we have in the United States, the private companies that's, that uh, give uh, uh, medical assistance. So in, 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 in public sectors, we have around 42, 45% cesarean section rate. It is three times what the World Health Organization says is the best, 45%. But in, but in the private sector and in, 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 the, in the security sector, we have 85% cesarean section. So middle class in Brazil has 85% cesarean section rate. And the reason for that is that all our system is based in doctors, not in midwives. All of that is because doctors, they don't want, they don't know, and they fear birth. They have no idea how birth happens. They have no intent to understand birth because they know that when they assist a normal birth, they are at risk. When they do cesarean sections, they have no risk because the system protects, the corporation protects. And that's why I think that the only way to deal with the problem is not continue the wrong path we did in the last 20, 25 years that I work in the Humanization of Childbirth Network, trying to convince doctors, trying to educate doctors, because this will never work. The only way to do, uh, uh, to, to modify, is to give human rights to women in Brazil during childbirth is to abandon the false idea of reforming obstetrics in Brazil. We need to do a revolution in obstetrics in, in, obstetrics in Brazil because that's the only way we will give to midwives, the people that are trained, people that are that, that which like to do vaginal birth and stop giving normal birth to surgeons. Because if, if, when we do that, surgeons will probably do a cesarean sections because it's safer for them, even though it's more risky for women. 
And so my idea is that there is two things that we need to do. First one is to empower women and give information and tell them what is best for them and for the babies, what is best for their health, what is uh, and that cesarean sections are marvelous surgeries that should only be used when there is a dramatic situation that demands an, an immediate, immediate uh, action from uh, the, the obstetric team. And the second one is midwifery. We need to bring midwives to our teams, teach midwives, um, show them how important is midwives for the planet, not only for women, for men and for babies and for governments and for everyone. Our chance is to transform the way we see birth instead of a medical procedure, instead of a hospital procedure, a natural procedure, a, a natural event in every woman's life, in every family's life. And that's my idea, to work with women and to work with midwives teach them and in a way to transform, not only to reform, but to transform the way we assist and we take care of women during childbirth. Thank you so much, Doctor. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, Nicole, uh, do you want to ask something or we have to continue like this? Sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, Were you speaking to me, Lily? Yes, yes, Paul. Yeah. Do you want to continue uh, this? Yes, game? maybe make a suggestion Sorry, of how many minutes. Yes. Yeah. How many minutes would you like yeah, people to do that? Everyone, everyone can, yeah, one minute for everyone introduction only. <laughs> <laughs> because we have to manage the time. <laughs> okay, let's go for the next uh, wonderful team member, educational team, Iran. Okay, over to you, Paul, from now. Uh, if you want to add something, yeah. It's, it's, for me, it's yeah. not so clear in my headphone. So, no, I was happy with what you're doing. If everybody's going to introduce themselves, but maybe you wanted to suggest it's, uh, you know, keep it like three or four minutes or two minutes or what you, what you need. How is it for you? What do you one, need? One minute introduction and one minute okay. about the first question. Yeah. Yeah. Ian, please, over you and to you. Okay. Shall we move on to Diane, perhaps? Is that okay with you, Diane? Yeah, sure. Anybody. Would you like to introduce yourself and then say something about okay. kind of answering that question? We hear you. Yeah, it's um, it's so lovely to see everybody tonight. Um, my name is Diane. I'm an Irish trained midwife, but I've been working for the last seven years in Uganda. Um, I have two different fields of practice. I practice in a small birth center that I opened in one of the slum communities in Kampala. And then um, I offer home birth and water birth to usually expat mothers, usually foreign uh, overseas mothers that have come into Uganda that want to have that home birth experience. Um, I worked as a sick children's nurse. I was a registered sick children's nurse for 10 years and neonatal nurse uh, before I became a midwife. But midwifery was all my, always my, my passion. Um, and I, I have to be honest and say that I, I lost that passion very much because of what I'm now hearing from colleagues of mine who are currently working in the UK. Um, just yesterday, a friend of mine has come out for three, for three months to spend with me. She's left midwifery in the UK for um, after two years of training. Um, and it's just exactly what people are saying here as to how midwifery is now seen. And everything is a medical um, is a medical institution now. Um, I my clinic is called Amani Family Center. And what Paul was saying there about fear, the reason I called it Amani, Amani is Swahili for peaceful. And in sub-Saharan Africa, we we are ashamed to say that we have some of the highest maternal death rates and neonatal death rates as well. Um, and when you speak to mothers in Uganda, regardless of whether they have money or no money, they all talk about the same. They all talk about fear. They all talk about abuse. They all talk about how when they go into the health centers, they don't have a choice. They do what they're told. And that's very much, again, what Paul has been saying in his presentation, um, just about power. So Amani, we strive very much to build relationships with these mothers. We have three midwives. There's myself and two local midwives. 
um, we, we are pretty much a low, a low risk birth centre. So that means that we, we don't have a theatre and therefore if we do have a mother that's particularly high risk, we have to send that mother to one of the local government hospitals, which sadly, I'll, I'll not say too much. <laughs> Uh, we we lose a lot of we lose a lot of um, say in that, in that mother's care, but we do our best to keep them with us for as long as possible. Um, in terms of the home birth, a lot of women who are from overseas who come working as missionaries, they're working for NGOs, they're coming from the US, Canada, UK, Australia, everywhere, and they they all know that back where they come from, they have this choice of home birth and because of the stories that go around about the hospitals in Africa, a lot of them are just terrified at the thought of going into the hospitals. And many of them who used to go into the hospitals, they go because they are going to get obstetric care and they pay a lot of money to get this obstetric care. And one of the most expensive hospitals in Kampala has a 74% cesarean section rate, which is just astounding. And um, people here, they see good care as being obstetric and being in theatre. So if you have money, then you can afford good care, which is in the big hospitals. And those big hospitals offer you the easy way out. The easy way out. I don't, it's not, of course, the easy way out. Um, so, yeah, it's a very, very interesting place to work. I absolutely love what I do. Um, it's two very different clientele. The birth centre is women from the slum. Um, who are already very, very severely marginalized because they can't afford to go to these big hospitals. Um, and they often go to the witch doctor. They often go to these poorly trained TBAs. Um, and often they stay, they just stay at home because they're afraid to go to the hospital. So we like to think that we provide a halfway house for them before having to go to the hospital. Um, Diana, I might... Yeah. I might I might come in if I'm not interrupting you. Um, yeah. How how fantastic hearing everything. You're really doing action on the ground in challenging situations. Yeah. How can you see more human rights approach or women having more rights, more bodily autonomy? What will it take or what would it look like? Is it doing what you're doing or is there anything else that could be done? Uh, I think, Paul, it's it's probably one of my biggest fears here because it's such an enormous job. Um, I first came to Uganda in 1989, and I was seeing practices then, I am still seeing today, and it is still very much doctor, patient. I know best, and therefore I have to stick my fingers in you to see what's going on. Could the um, law make a difference if there were legal cases? The, 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 problem, um, the problem is with here is corruption is a huge thing. Um, a lot of people go into medicine and other health professionals because they know it's going to make them money. Everybody opens their own clinic and they, they get lots of money coming in from that. So there is always that, um, always that push of money. And unfortunately, the government are gaining from that. So maybe you are the change. You're the alternative doing what you're doing. I try. I'm, I'm in a community of 40,000 uh, 40, people. And we're one small slum in a, an enormous city. Um, I mean, Kampala City has a population of 3.5 million. Perhaps we'll have a migration and, of Irish and British nurses leaving there and coming yeah, to Africa. Yeah, and, and it's really, it's, it's building relationships and it's teaching. One of the things I've done with my staff is, is very much teaching them about the importance of relationships with these mothers. A mother has to trust me to come to me. She has to trust me to phone and say, Diane, I feel this, I have a problem. But when they're humiliated and they're, they're just treated like second-class citizens, a lot of women, they, they run away from the hospital. So we, we like to think we're, we're giving a little bit of compassion and dignity that they don't find anywhere else. Thank you for that. Because of time, I will move on to others. What I hear you talking about relationship, I'm sure everybody can identify this as the building block. We all need this good relationship of trust and women will choose birth outside the system or alternatives or even challenging the system, hopefully. Anything you need to say, Diana? Is it okay to move on to the next one? No, that's fine, yeah. Thank you very much. Irene Chain in New Zealand, sometimes in China, sometimes in other places. Welcome and let's hear from you, Irene. Okay. 
Well, thank you, Paul, for that. I'm just going to quickly say that I've been a midwife for 42 years. I've traveled around the world. I've seen how things shouldn't be done and I focus on how things need to be done. I've seen, I wish I could say I've seen more women uh, jump with joy after having a baby, uh, but it's evident in lots of countries that uh, the financial aspect, money and control, takes over women's rights. I'm just going to read to you because we are starting our own communities here in New Zealand outside the system. So I just want to read you two little articles of our community because it resonates with human rights. Because if we're going to have human rights, it's got to come from the essence and the soul of our communities. So I'm just going to read you this, okay? If you would bear in mind the time thing in case it's, it's anyone else. It's just very asking. quickly, it's just a couple of sentences, okay? Okay, so this is we, that we the people of the proclaimed sovereign Hapu, that's the community, have proclaimed ourselves of sovereign state, being our heartfelt commitment made to our creator to live our lives to the best of our abilities in honour of creation and in service to all humanity. Number two, that we the people of the proclaimed sovereign Hapu seek to uphold as peacefully as possible the absolute human right to life of all peoples expressed through the absolute right to self-determination being the right of every man and every woman to express themselves freely and determine their own affairs whilst causing no harm to another. I believe that the essence comes from our communities um, in a republic moving away from corporate systems and moving away from the systems that we have now because they are failing, they are failing humanity. And the beautiful thing about what has happened in the last three years, we've had a total exposure. Uh, so it's just showing you that things are changing here because in our corporate system they're driving midwives out of the system and they're driving it back to obstetric nurses and total control of childbirth in hospitals because that's what makes them money. So, I mean, would you like to say what you've created there that's an alternative reality with the Indigenous uh, Well, we created a new health council, the Wakamaninga Health Council, that's endorsed by the United Chief Tribes, working under Indigenous people's jurisdiction. Um, so we're all setting up up and down the country our own communities uh, with our own judicial systems that will be coming into place. We're preparing this. And the midwifery uh, council for the indigenous, well, I understand. We have a, the Wakamanga Health Council has the midwifery council. It's got the uh, you know, the, the natural therapist council. It's got you know like chiropractic and everything. So we've got lots and lots of different councils under the Hapu. I think the so question I, uh, before I move on to somebody else is that yeah. you've created an alternative midwifery council. So the one yes. that was bashing the midwives and not working very well bowing to corporate power play. That's You've right. created an alternative reality saying we're yes. registered with the Indigenous Midwifery Council. They say we can do twins or breach at home. It's fine. Whereas the other one would probably limit some of the care that can be given. Absolutely. We've got the, the, the decisions are going to come from the ground level, from the woman and the midwives themselves, and they'll be telling us what they want and what they need in their communities. Uh, so it, this is a huge challenge because our corporate system doesn't like it. We, we're getting attacked by it. We have a court case coming up at the end of um, October. But they have no choice because yeah. we have the rights of people. We, the people, have the power. And we have to know and understand the laws. We have to understand natural I'm going to move, move yes. along. We, the people, have the power. Yes. To create our reality. Can I thank you very, very much, Irene? That's Sorry it, it's okay. so brief. And That's all right. Along. Thank you. How about Edson? Would you be okay to come next?
Welcome. So just go ahead, Edson. Hello. Um, I'm, I'm very happy. I'm very glad to be here with you. Today I'm in the Amazon region here in Brazil. It's a very beautiful place. Well, I'm, I have been working at uh, Sofia Feldman Hospital for more than 10 years. It's uh, the largest maternity hospital in Brazil. We have more than 10,000 childbirths per year. And this year we will, um, we will have uh, 40 years old. We will be 40 years old this year. And this hospital, since its founding uh, 40 years ago, uh, we have practiced a, a, a model of care um, centered in the woman, family, and in the midwives. Our founder, uh, invited a midwife in the first day to come to our hostel and to care for a uh, child, child, uh, childbirth. And because of that, our hostel was chosen by Health Ministry of Brazil as a model of care uh, in 2011. This year, Brazil Health Ministry launched historic network it it was a very large strategy and a, 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 a official politics in brazil and it aimed to change the model of care and i have been working in this project since that years and i i was very hopeful in the beginning of the project but Unluckily, this project was, um, it, it, it don't exist anymore. Uh, the current government in Brazil decided to finalize this project. And we understood this as, um, yes, we, uh, the, the humanization movement in Brazil was defeated in these days. Um, I think we made some progress. Um, stock, the stock network made some progress in Brazil. Uh, the companionship is uh, 10 years ago, almost no hostel accepted companionship during labor. And this changed indeed. I, I think this, this was a big victory because we have this law since 2005, 2005, and step by step, things improved a little. And this is a very large victory because when we have companion inside hostels, this is a very large step because companions, even when they are not prepared, even then when they don't know anything about childbirth, they are there, they are beside the mother, and they are beside their wives. And this is a very important thing. Uh, I think um, this What's is- What's next? What, what would I think you this like is to... one of, yes, the, the, the big progress we've made. So fantastic. So we know that having a good companion during birth reduces interventions and it shortens the length of labor by a woman being mobile with good companion. But what's next? What could you see or what would you like to see change to respect women's human rights in Brazil? What yes, kind of action? This, is a, a, this was a large victory, but yeah. we have yet many things to do. We have in Brazil less than 10,000 midwives. We need around 50,000 midwives. Yeah. And we are forming only less than 1,000 per year. We will need more than 50 years to reach <laughs> the number of midwives we need. 50 years at the uh, current, um, current rate, it's too low. But I think we have to, um, to uh, empower women. I agree with Ricardo and we have to we need more midwives. We have to empower them too. So if let's we begin it can now. do that, I, I think we, we will progress. So we're wishing to train midwives as a group. We can do this. 
<laughs> yes, we need to train because we have faced okay. uh, the medical corporation. They didn't uh, um, adhere to the to the changes. They 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 okay. indeed they resist change. They then they don't want change. And sometimes we find one or other that accept okay. them and collaborate. Thank you so much. Very good to hear from your energetic words and from your place in the world. And really appreciate that. I will thank you and move on. To thank you. Our next speaker, if it's okay with you, Karima who I understand you're in Indonesia from Afghanistan and you can introduce yourself. Assalamu alaikum, welcome. Assalamu alaikum, thank you all. It's really lovely to see you all and thank you for giving me chance for this uh, your nice meeting uh, tonight. I'm Karima from Afghanistan, uh, 33 years old. Uh, I'm a refugee and unfortunately because of the Situation in my country, I escaped from Afghanistan and I'm living as a refugee in Indonesia and in refugee camp. Uh, I'm a midwife. Uh, I have been working in Afghanistan as a midwife trainer and uh, as a mother and health, child health officer for, um, for remote areas in my province, uh, Baglan province in North Afghanistan. Uh, yeah, I choose to be a midwife because um, in Afghanistan from the last last uh, 40 or 45 years, there is war going in Afghanistan, unfortunately, and the lack of the education among the people. Uh, I lost my mother due to, I lost my mother. I can see I never see my mother's face because I lost my mother after the uh, 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 she gave me uh, birth uh, due to bleeding. After the uh, delivery bleeding, my mother uh, passed away because there was not access to health center and there was not midwife to help her. And so this is why I choose to be a midwife to help mothers. Uh, when I grow up and I did my school, uh, I worked in the, I did my midwifery degree in Kabul, Afghanistan, and I worked, uh, practiced in midwifery two big maternity hospitals in Kabul. Uh, there, I can say in uh, these two big center of birth mater, um, uh, maternity hospital, uh, in 24 hours, there is maybe around 90 to 110 deliveries in 24 hours. So- That's incredible. Uh, Somebody good at yeah. maths, how many a year? <laughs> Carry on, please. Uh, so the lack of midwives in, even in central Afghanistan, central Afghanistan, Kabul, in, of course, in provinces, remote areas, uh, a lot of, um, Need mid midwives as as uh, Afghanistan is the top rate of maternal maternal mortality rate. Uh, are some uh, midwives um, targeted by the Taliban, or the, are the Taliban sympathetic and helpful, and they need midwives to care for their own families? Or I've heard of some being murdered, for example. If you can say in the next yeah. twenty seconds. <laughs> Yeah, I know two midwives was raped by, by they, they go from the city to village, wanted to work in the health center. But unfortunately, uh, even, even treat, treated by Taliban, raped, uh, you know, during the uh, duty, even they would go with husband or maybe family. And uh, one of them died. And one of them skipped already from Afghanistan back because they all her 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 life destroyed. And uh, because uh, their ideas uh, are different with Taliban and the midwives, what uh, the health system uh, and the women need in Afghanistan uh, is totally different. If if the midwives say to women to save their life, to bring uh, peace to their uh, uh, to use family planning to not bring too much children, like uh, a mother uh, uh, bring uh, 10 or 12 
child. So during her life, so and maybe five or four time abortion. So it will uh, uh, dangerous for her life or maybe the early the early marriage. Uh, uh, before 18, they will get married with them, uh, so it will be so dangerous for them. Like if they uh, come to uh, the health center to do the um, if, if uh, delivery. If I can ask you one question, is it more dangerous for Afghan or foreign midwives? So if we've got Medicine uh, Sans Frontier sending foreign midwives, would they be safer or just also dangerous for them? It's also dangerous for them. For yeah. uh, we'll probably yeah. have to move. Uh, uh, themselves, the Afghan Afghan midwife also not safe on the on the village, okay. uh, like in their country. Because of the time constraints, I'm going to move on. But what I've done is asked you to open your heart. You've told us about your mother's death, incredibly powerful things about other midwives. It's very hard to move on. We will for, for the sake of time. And what we do is look forward to having a much more engagement, um, learning more from you and sharing more from you. Is it okay to move on now? Or did I interrupt you? No, it's okay. Sir. Um, and... Uh, yeah, this is the this is what happening in my country. Some some this is all because of the uneducated and the well, many years war there, and uh, they say because of the so much religious because so much religious they they think if they do family planning, they they give the family planning uh, materials for it is it's against of Islam it's against yeah. stuff like. So what the God give us, let, let the baby come every year, one, one child every year, or maybe after nine months, one child. So, so you're under and, threat just for giving family planning, as I understand it. Yeah, yeah. 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 This is why okay. they are instead of these things that uh, not use family planning, because they want to minimize the Islam uh, yeah. believers. Like. Yeah. <laughs> so everything's under threat. I will, for the sake of time, have to move on to the next speaker. I really look forward to having a much bigger session. Perhaps we can have you giving a, a whole talk on this. I'm sure we can. So yeah. thank you, Karima. I thank will move you, on. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Is Kevin... Thank you so much. Are you ready and okay to go next, Kevin? Yeah, Paul. So yeah. good morning, good afternoon, or good evening. Depends on where you are from the world. And first of all, let me thank you, Paul, for the brilliant presentation. That really gave me a lot of inspiration. Um, I am a psychologist, a clinical psychologist. I hold a PhD in applied psychology and also work on my second PhD degree, which is uh, healthcare system management. Um, I work as PhD tutor at Philippine Christian University based in Manila, Philippine. Uh, I'm Chinese. Um, so I also run my own counseling office based in China. I offer one-to-one -one session to clients as well as to organizations. Um, for example, um, for the moment, I'm working on a project with the Dutch company, Shell, the petrol company, also Fleur, uh, the biggest uh, project company uh, based in the US, with headquarters in the US. So uh, most of my clients are with uh, psycho problems like uh, depression, uh, or anxiety disorder, or PTSD, or ESD, or personality disorders like that. And uh, most of them, we, we, we discover that it's associated with their early experience, i.e. when they are infants, and uh, when they're a child. I was influenced deeply by a British psychologist, Donald Wenicourt. So they discovered a lot with every, with a human being, the early day. Um, experience. So this is also part of my job to study how and um, you know what shaped a person's personality. About six years ago, Irene introduced me to this uh, a brand new, a whole new area made way for it. So I, Irene is like my tutor. So it's, it's been there for a long time. So from that time on, I started to work uh, for China modern midwifery service system. Um, I was so happy that I could take part in that procedure to help um, a lot of mothers and help to train 
um, make referees and doctors. And most of our clients are big public hospitals based in China. Um, yeah, so um, I talk about uh, the topic, how to support the human right during the birth. I think there are two things we can do. Give you an example, about four days ago, when I visited Fleur based in China, so uh, it's very interesting, you know, most of the foreign staff are from England and from the UK actually, and most of them are from uh, Scotland and also not East England. So accents are really a problem for me. One day I was so happy to talk to a guy, said, oh, okay, you speak English? He said, yes, I'm from Kent, <laughs> so I'm okay. Uh, about um, two months ago, because most of the foreign staff, they have to stay in the yard, the shipyard, because of the, the pandemic. They cannot go out. And most of them haven't got a chance to go back to England. Um, a lot of gym factors caused a, a British gentleman. He jumped off the tall building and suicide himself from the 21st building. That's a tragedy. And about three weeks ago, another German engineering manager, he, he, he suffered a heart attack, then he died again. So I, I start to ask, what shipped that? And then I got another client and flew at the same company. And he's from uh, Shell, I think, the Dutch petrol company. And he asked me a question. He said, that's during a one-to-one -one session. He said, Dr. Liang, I hope to ask you a question because my wife has got pregnant again. I am not sure whether to keep this kid or not. You know, abortion in China is legal. When I heard that question, it's like, uh, you know, my heart is, is like, it's like, you know, I feel the pain. You, you see, nowadays in my country, it's the women, the mother, is not able to make their own choice, but hundred percent freedom, because she has to balance um, their father, their parents-in-law, and their their husband opinion. But this so, is China you're talking about. Yeah, this China. He told me that my wife wants to keep this kid. And can you tell me, because I said, how about you, Apine? He said, well, that's a burden, you know, uh, uh, economic, because it's, it's to keep a child, a lot of money missing in China. I said, sorry, I can't give you any suggestion. But it were me, I will be so delighted to welcome this, this very beautiful creation, this new baby to our family, because it's your baby. So but eventually he said, I will consider carefully about your advice, Dr. Liang, because it's very important. He said, I really wish one day, yeah, sorry, Paul. No, please finish that sentence. You wish one yeah, day. I, I wish one day there's new abortion in China and all through the world. Let's, let's celebrate and welcome every new life to the beautiful world. So that's their right, that's human right. And let's hope that we can have human rights in China, because when I was there to even talk about human rights in a critical way of the government would put me in prison. I was told, don't criticize the government. And that week they put <laughs> activists in jail when we were there lecturing. So human rights in each country means quite a different thing. And yet it's a fundamental thing globally. Thank you so much, Kevin. Because of the short time, this is a great introduction. We're going to, I'm sure, have much longer speeches and conferences. So this is just this quick one and we'll move on. Thank, Thank you, you so much again, Kevin. Uh, I think the last person I can see is yes. Manju. Sorry, one minute. Doctor is Lily. complaining. Uh, that's why he has to go. He wants to say bye to everybody. And uh, because he was in there very time pressure. And just I wanted to say, he say bye to everybody. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, please. Sorry. So who, who left? Yeah, I, I think I, I'm only the yeah. one left. Manu, yes, thank mm -hmm. you. Namaste. Yeah, namaste. Uh, thank you so much uh, for this uh, interaction and very lively discussion, in fact. And uh, I want to tell you that uh, my name, you all know, and I have introduced uh, that I'm working as Dean School of Nursing Sciences Allied Health in Jamia Hamdard. Uh, not wasting much time on that, I want to tell you about that. Uh, how, what was our experience in India working with White Ribbon Alliance India? We did a What Women Want campaign because we are uh, we were doing a study in one of the remote area of uh, uh, Bihar, and we we realized that it's not only the facilities from the healthcare providers; it's the women also 
who are whether they are aware of it or not that what are their rights uh, whether uh, they are getting a uh, decent care with the uh, with respect or not but when we asked women they said we it is services are not accessible so easily and if i am getting any kind of service i am feeling satisfied so that was the answer then we thought no we have to do this study to find out what women wants then finally it came out as three wants uh, when we were ranking it that they want respect they want information and they want uh, that they should get a care so uh, because in india it's not easy to uh, have access to skilled birth attendants or the care by the healthcare providers earlier in 1972 uh that time there were uh, training of uh, dais home births and all then slowly slowly we moved uh, to institutional births and there is a maternity benefit uh, which is given if they come to institution or uh, hospital to give birth and that's that government started but hospitals were not prepared to receive so many cases because earlier there were home births but now it's 90% births are in institutions and hospitals are not ready to handle these births so it's all the more difficult situation uh, but government wanted this to happen and uh, this has been done now again it is coming back that india wants midwives because global evidence suggests that midwives have made a lot of difference in maternal mortality morbidity and also lowering the cesarean section rates as brazil is highest in and in, in world in india there is a state called and telangana which is highest in cesarean section and their midwives have uh, midwives training have started first in india in telangana because highest cesarean section uh, they they uh, they have given this uh, solution that to have midwives it is going to reduce cesarean sections and also uh, we we are doing lot of advocacy for midwives in india through uh, through various um, uh, um, medias like we are using mass media we are using ngos we are uh, going to ministry to advocate uh, and we are having a training program of uh, six countries multi country midwifery initiative program six countries are uh, getting trained how to advocate for midwifery i think there is lot to talk about uh, india because it's a huge country but i would like to tell you that uh, uh, the rights human rights which are applied earlier they were not allowed to choose their positions freely only on the back as gail said that it's a it's a abuse i agree with her now we allow them we have a, a provision of allowing companion with them that's also uh not in toto happening everywhere but the policy has been made um they they are given the information they were not uh, having the privacy curtains were there but they were not put on so uh, they uh, with white ribbon alliance charter uh, of their rights uh, it uh, these things have been introduced those seven rights that right to be able to uh, get care right to control their birthing options a uh, right to privacy right to companionship right to freedom from any kind of discrimination to have highest attainable level of care and uh, right to not to be separated from uh, from their children or the newborn all those things have been added lot have been uh, done but a uh, lot is to be done that's it's, the situation it's great it sounds yeah. like women know they have some rights and some rights. that can be yeah. that yeah. can build up to be more do you think the traditional birth attendants would like to train as midwives would uh, some of them no, no no we we were having trained uh, traditional birth attendants and i think it's more than 25 years uh, they have not been allowed to practice because we we started yeah. with auxiliary nurse midwives and they were there in villages to uh, to give birth to uh, to help mothers to give birth so we are now in the phase of training starting training institutions in midwifery so first we are training the trainers educators. is it a problem that it's going to be in institutions could we be training people in the community or doing both perhaps 
yeah they will be going to uh, communities also these midwives because right. we are going to train from local areas not right. uh, each uh -huh. state province will have their own training centers so they will be working there only and we hope right. that uh, the uh, the marginalized people the places where there is no access to healthcare they will go there and serve the community like diana is doing and i am very impressed with her work like she's doing there in uganda and all so exactly uh, yeah yeah i think because of paucity of time uh, i would stop here but there is lot to share and i think we'll have another session well this yeah, is a brief session just now and i go back yeah. to layla to control the meeting but it's yeah. a fantastic <laughs> everybody i'm listening to i'm hungry to have a lot more i want one to one with everybody so even the people watching will want more I'm sure we will arrange something quite soon. Perhaps Leila can help us out what her, their plans might like to be. Thank you, everybody. Sure. Thank you so much. You want to so me about Iran? You forgot me. <laughs> okay, who did I forget? There is no Leila from Iran. <laughs> Sorry. That's okay. <laughs> Beautiful. Okay. <laughs> okay, no problem. Let's finish. Everybody are tired. I don't have no. anything to say. Can I say something about Iran? Can I ask? Yeah, okay. Uh, okay, I am Leila Mostofi. I am registered certified midwife from Iran. And just I want to add very a small brief description. I'm all, I'm founder of the Excellence Center and Sam GMC from Samco UK. Uh, we have started uh, our uh, Institute from 10 years ago from Iran. So let me just I tell you about Iran. In Iran, we have 80,000 midwives and they are trying to uh, reduce maternal mortality rate uh, because of midwifery practice. Uh, and uh, so Iran is among the countries that have achieved the fifth goal, uh, goal of the United Nations Millennium Development Goal. The maternal, maternal mortality ratio in Iran has declined from 48 cases per 100,000 in 2000 to 16 cases per 100,000 in 2017, showing an uh, annual decline rate of about 8.3 percent. Uh, so it was because of the uh, presence of the midwife and they did too much in public health sector, in private sectors. Uh, but nowadays, the problem in Iran, especially from Tehran and capital and um, the metro cities, is that women are engaged with materialistic life and they want to be always very fashion and look like Kardashian family. So because of that, they had many, many brainwashed with some of um, this fashion uh, advice uh, to have less birth, to have less normal birth because they want to uh, have an unshaped vagina and plus the woman, uh, they are more into fashion instead of empowering themselves and believing on themselves. That's why we have started Woman Empowerment in Iran to give them more uh, confidence about her, uh, natural beauty, about, about uh, believing on themselves than going to uh, surgery and try for natural birth. Uh, we are doing many things in Iran, and uh, this is the problem for this generation we have. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you. What are your plans for the future with more meetings? If you want to share anything now, I think everybody's kind of excited to want to have more. Sure. Actually, we are, yeah, 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 please. Uh, what I'm hearing, and I just would like to quickly sum it up, is we need education. We need education to the consumer, to the, the pregnant lady, so she can be empowered to find out her rights. Mm -hmm. So she's empowered to make choices. Mm -hmm. So she's empowered. Educating the consumer is where we're all talking about because change must come from consumers. It cannot come from a few of us. Correct. Thank so you. I think that's yeah. the best. That bottom line. Yeah, yeah, we have to increase okay. and improve our education. We are empowering midwives, empowering nurses, empowering doctors with new education. It doesn't mean just to highlight the name of midwife. It means empowering women. 
and sustainable family. It is what we are looking for. And in this multidisciplinary team, we can reach to that. So uh, yeah, all of us together, we are going to educate nurses and midwives and doctors from different parts of the globe. And uh, we will do it. We did many things in this year and this many panels, many training, different parts of the world proved how much we were helping. And many mothers are happy because of this trained midwife who went from our uh, training uh, periods. Is there yep. anybody else got a final word? Diane, do you need to say anything? You're the one real action on the ground there in, in Uganda. Are you okay? I was I was just typing there. I have no power tonight. So I'm I'm looking very scary with a candle. <laughs> That's so romantic, I mean, don't they? Okay, let's so, take that sorry. freeze. Go ahead. Question? No, it's just if there's any final thing you needed to say or share. No, I, I think, um, I mean, I've, I've just been making notes as people have been talking and uh, there are just so many different spokes to everything that everybody is saying from um, the different countries, but it all boils down to the same thing. It all boils down to the relationship that we have with these women and their families and um, just doing this for everybody, whether it be midwife, whether it be obstetrician, um, and it's it's a big job, but I think together we can try and at least make a start. Thank you. You're right. Yeah. Lily, what would you like to do next? <laughs> everybody who wants to add something. Otherwise, thank you, everybody. Thank you for beautiful words of you, and we enjoyed so much. We will make another plan in next session. Let's we edit, we edit this video. Then after editing, we will provide to all of you. We will publish. So we will arrange another meeting all together to continue this discussion. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paul. It was fantastic. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for spending time. I love you. Let's change the world together. Amazing, Lily. Excellent center team. Love you. Thank you, everybody. Take care of yourselves. Take care, Karima. Thank you. We can talk later. Bye. Diane, I hope to get to chat to you sometime soon, if you're free or when you're free. And everybody, Ricardo, thank you. Yeah. Let's birth some change. Okay. <laughs>